Hello and welcome back to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger Green. Welcome to 2024. This is the first lecture in a course that I'm offering, um, uh, also a course through uh, being offered through Metropolitan State University of Denver, spring semester of 2024. That is an introduction to critical theory. And our first reading is going to be from Herbert Marcuse. The book that I'm referring to um, in terms of page numbers is just the um, critical theory, essential readings um, uh, put out by Paragon Issues and Philosophy. Uh, David Ingram and Julia Simon Ingram are the editors here. Um, if you're looking for that, on the um, CCC Theories website, of course, I've listed all of the PDFs and given access to PDFs. So if you're looking to read along with us or you've found that web page already, um, please uh, refer to those texts. I'm going to dig into um, really a reading of Marcuse's essay here. So I'm gonna pull up and read from from my notes um, on on it. So we've got, uh, um, you won't just have my talking head here. Um, I can share the PDF as well, um, but this helps us be a little bit more ADA accessible. I know that YouTube will do the, the captioning as well, but it doesn't always do a great job. So, um, one thing to note before I sort of dig into the reading here is that, of course, a hundred years after the foundation for the Institute of Social Research in Frankfurt, Germany, um, we are looking back. Um, some of you may have watched my videos from lecture videos from uh, 2022 when I was first starting the Critical Theory Center, and I was reflecting on what does that mean, you know, the past hundred years in critical theory. And with that, rightly so, people have criticized the Frankfurt School. Um, and in the current state of doing critical theory, um, there's a lot of questioning about where allegiances ended up among some of these earlier critical theorists. How progressive really were they um, is a big question that's coming up. And um, uh, I think I mentioned Gabriel Rockhill and he runs the, um, the workshop for critical theory between Paris and Villanova University. He's a great resource here. Um, Samuel Moyne, who's a great thinker as well, has recently criticized the Frankfurt School. I'm aware that those criticisms are out there, but for an intro course, um, we need to kind of go back to these thinkers and, and just understand what they were saying to begin with, right? So the, my main goal right here isn't to give a current state of things, it's more to give a close reading of some important essays uh, throughout um, the, the, the first century of, of critical theory as, um, as it exists. Um, another big critique I, I, I should mention from the outset um, has to do with what's called cultural Marxism. Um, and I talk about that in my lectures as this shift in 20th century theory um, towards culture and towards aesthetics. And that's why in my center, I call it the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. Um, I want to emphasize that the turn towards cultural analysis happens among Frankfurt School thinkers because they're trying to understand um, what Marx might have left out. Now, of course, this means that it potentially leads back towards a kind of idealism or a kind of Hegelianism where we're dealing with ideas and we're dealing less with material history. And this is a big point of current critique um, among critical theorists. I just want to contextualize historically that what I feel like the Frankfurt School was doing was was trying to see what might have been missing in Marx. Um, it's not to say that the current critiques are not are not on track or anything like that, but I just want to 
go back to this this time period and try and contextualize it. So Marcuse's essay for today is called Philosophy and Critical Theory, first published in a journal in 1937. And that's going to be important, right? This is not the very beginnings of the Frankfurt School or the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt, Germany in the early 1920s. We will have other lectures that talk about that moment, but already about 15 years after the Institute is founded and writing from a place in the United States, right? So Marcuse has already fled Nazi Germany. And um, uh, after 1933, first he goes to Geneva, then he ends up in New York. Um, so he's already reflecting 15 years back on, on what the agenda was for critical theory um, as, as it began. And that's going to be important. The other thing that's going to be important here as I venture into the my reading here are claims that Joseph Stalin made in 1936 about having reached a universal socialism in the Soviet Union. Um, that I might pop out of my reading here and say a little bit more on. Uh, but when we're looking at what Mark place that Marcuse is writing and, and thinking about this in 1937, I think that those events are really, really important. Now, of course, it's before we get the full outbreak of World War II. So this is happening before World War II as well. Um, but definitely as a Jew himself, um, Marcuse has already felt um, the brunt of the Nazi party and had to flee for his life the entire Institute for Social Research moved their money first to Amsterdam. They set up uh, um, uh, an outpost in Geneva. One of the economists from the Frankfurt School um, helped set that up, but they all end up pretty quickly um, um, through Paris, London, New York. They have to flee Europe um, because of um, not only their politics, but in many, many cases because they were Jewish. Uh, so that's something else to think of. And then before one last thing before jumping in here. So there are other books, you know, like this book, The Politics of Unreason by Lars Rensman, um, who wants to say that in our critiques, partly of or at least in the 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 fame that the Frankfurt School has gotten over the years, that 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 one of the things that we have neglected in broader discourse, with respect to the Frankfurt thinkers was how they were addressing the issue of anti-Semitism, um, which of course fueled their reasoning for having to flee um, Europe. And um, among our the well-deserved criticisms, I think that, that we're laying out in current critical theory towards the Frankfurt School um, in the mid 20th century, I think that we need to also have an ear towards what the general discussion has has neglected. Um, and so to, yes, great attention to, to, to thinkers like Samuel Moyne, to um, Gabriel Rockhill, but also to um, someone like Lars Rensman here as well. All of this stuff might not make make much sense to you if you're this is a if this is your first foray into critical theory, but it's um want to have some attention to current discourse as well. Um, but of course, this is an intro class, so let's just uh, uh, jump in here to, to my reading here. In this reading of Marx, Marcuse's um, critique, um, it is important to note that Marcuse left Germany for Geneva in May of 1933 after breaking with his mentor, Martin Heidegger, who had joined the Nazi party. Um, that's at University of Marburg. The following year, so in 1934, Marcuse emigrated to the United States to work in the Frankfurt School's branch housed in Columbia University in New York. And so we sometimes say the Frankfurt School, sometimes we say the Institute for Social Research, which was the institute in Frankfurt that had to be moved um, until after World War II. It ends up in the United States. From the start, according to Marcuse here, Critical theory has recognized that it must be interdisciplinary. 
Marcuse begins by noting that critical theorists realized that economic conditions are, quote, responsible for the totality of established world and that a social framework organizes reality. At the basis then for doing critical theory, we are interdisciplinary and that we are talking about a social framework. We're talking about the social conditions that organize reality. There's always going to be an attention on society and not necessarily the individual. From the beginning, that's part of the method of doing critical theory, right? So that realization meant that critical theory could not rely on traditional philosophy alone because traditional philosophy had um, relied on a robust concept of capital, I, maybe I should say capital R reason. So reason, which had been primarily a primary focus in especially European philosophy, now needed to be seen in economic terms. That's what critical theory brings is this melding of not just philosophy and not just eco economics, but some sort of blending of the two of them. So yet critical theory is not simply economics as understood by academics. Again, I'm just summarizing Marcuse's argument here. Um, it gains from philosophy an emphasis on concepts, but regards those concepts in terms of a materialist history. Critical theory of society is premised on an economic analysis of material history, as well as a, quote, concern with human happiness and the conviction that it can be attained only through a transformation of the material conditions of existence. This is something that critical theory will inherit from 19th century Marxism, um, the emphasis on historical materialism and on economic analysis. Theory alone, says Marcuse, will not construct a new society. That must be done through the organic collaboration of liberated individuals. However, our idea of individuality needs to be itself situated within a material history. When we do so, we see that the modern subject um, sometimes modern European, quote, man, and they use masculinist language here, and I'm going to follow that instead of trying to correct it all of the time to include um, she. Um, I think a lot of them will um, think of, quote, man in terms of a broader um, concept of humanity, um, but, but, but we should also, you know, it also obscures gender. Um, by trying to universalize it and so it obscures real differences that we might know from later cr gender critiques, right? But I'm going to stick with their, their language here of man, um, even if it's masculinist um, for the moment, just for historical um, context. Um, so our idea of individuality needs to be situated in material history. When we do so, we see that this modern subject um, uh, of philosophy, the modern individual subject, um, is the product of a bourgeois society. Marcuse critiques philosophy's reliance on rationality and the human capacity to reason. This is all throughout continental European philosophy um, from the Renaissance up to when Marcuse has, is writing this, and, and it, to a certain extent, continues in the discipline of philosophy today. Um, so this reliance on rationality and the human capacity to reason is something he will call in to critique. Reason as fundamental to all capital B being meant that the world could no longer exist in a dialectical, dialectical fashion as exterior. Reason becomes or is in philosophy, quote, authentic reality. This was idealism in thinkers like Hegel, but maybe even more so if you read philosophy in someone like George Berkeley. The world had, had sense as realized through reason and reason implies freedom because one must be able to act according to the realizations of reason. So 
again, Marcuse is saying that traditional philosophy has centralized reason as the most fundamental human capacity, is what is partly what defines us as humans, is it an organizing principle, and closely tied with that is the implication that because we have reason as rational subjects, we also have the freedom to act upon our reason, right? Freedom conceptually um, here is part and built into our capacity to reason. So if reason is conceptually tied to freedom, freedom can only come through an internalized concept of rational action. Quote, reason and freedom become the tasks of the individual that the individual is to fulfill within himself, and he can do so regardless of external conditions. While Kant presented this as an unfolding of world history progressing towards perpetual peace, Kant has a famous uh, essay on perpetual peace. Hegel and the idealists more accurately saw it as a bad present. Ne necessity is no longer outside of freedom and outside of reason, but subordinated to the conditions of the individual alienated subject. What they mean is that in European philosophy, especially after René Descartes, what we start seeing is an increasing turn towards individual interior subjectivity and my ability to think as an internal subject only in terms of concepts, even a concept of something like God, G-O-D, capital G-O-D, right, only ends up being an interiorized con concept or an, my idea of the infinite, right, but God outside might be infinite. And so I'm only working within an internalized, um, rational, conceptual system um, uh, and that subordination to rationality means that we're kind of stuck as individuals within our own body's capacity to reason. And that's, of course, you know, it, it propels the Enlightenment thought in European philosophy. Um, but Hegel, in, in, as part of his counter-Enlightenment, has seen this as kind of like a trap that we're in. We're almost in a kind of trap of our own subjectivity because philosophy has made even our idea of necessity not a physical thing, but only relegated to our conceptual system of concepts. Um, so necessity is no longer outside of the freedom and reason, but subordinated to the conditions of the individual who is an alienated subject. Again, mostly I'm just, I'm elaborating a little bit to contextualize Mar Marcuse, but I'm mostly just giving a reading of Marcuse's essay here. Um, the result of the condition, again, according to Marcuse, is that one is truly free only when one is self-sufficient and self-reliant. That's the result of modern European philosophy. He will call this bourgeois philosophy. Everything outside of my own self-reliance or my own, own self-sufficiency becomes suspicious in this system. This had been the situation with philosophy. Quote, from the beginning, philosophy was sure that the highest mode of being was being within itself. This became tied to a notion of property. Quote, something is authentic when it is self-reliant can preserve itself and is not dependent on anything else. Way back with the ancients, while Aristotle could see rationality as beneficial to an individual's flourishing in the world, the modern relegation of reason to a detached conceptual ordering in itself, following Descartes, following Leibniz, following Kant, for example, illustrates a kind of constant toil that the subject is in for, quote, self-realization. This condition is certainly expressive of the bourgeois hold over economic production. When we look at this from a historical materialist perspective, right, like Marcuse is saying, when we look at it from the perspective of critical theory, we see that this individual self-reliant um, modern philosophical subject is the product of the economic history and the economic situation and the material history within Europe itself. And that erupts within the rising power of the bourgeois class, right? So what we take to be um, our natural individuality in the modern world 
is really conditioned by the material economic forces that um, give bourgeois capitalism uh, its hold in society. That's what Marcuse is saying here. So this, it's because it's materially and historically driven, it's more than just ideology. We might have all sorts of ideologies in liberal culture about individuality and, and, and prize individuals with, who are capable of bearing rights, all of that sort of stuff, but it's the material conditions that give rise to that ideology. So we don't wanna just say, oh, this is just an ideological fabrication um, uh, where, where we you know, promote how important individuality is. It's the idea, the ideology itself um, erupts with because of the material history. So ideology is only useful as a concept for critique when attached to the political order from the point of view of the critical theorist interested in exposing it as such in order to transform society. So we'll see this a little bit in my next lecture with Marx and Marx's theses on Feuerbach, but critical theory after Marx is trying to transform society. It's not just trying to take society or describe society as a status quo. So the false reality, according to Marcuse, of bourgeois rationality subordinates necessity and the world to the individual's capacity to conceive it and act upon it. The material, the material result of this is property. In this thinking, all intersubjectivity, again, is seen with suspicion. Um, the overwhelming emphasis in society is on my own ability as an individual self to survive uh, according to my rational means, right? My, my ability to, to um, fulfill my needs through my rational recognition of them, um, through my subordination of things external to me, to my own property. Quote, the materialist protest and materialist critique originated in the struggle of oppressed groups for being better living conditions and remain permanently associated with the actual process of the struggle. Moreover, a social situation has come about in which the realization of reason no longer needs to be restricted to pure thought and will. If reason means shaping life according to men's free decision on the basis of their knowledge, then the demand for reason henceforth means the creation of a social organization in which individuals can collectively regulate their lives in accordance with their needs. Social theory arose to accomplish this with the idea of a rational society. So to unpack this a little bit, originally when bourgeois culture arises, and this is according to Marxian analysis, we'll see with uh, my reading of uh, the Communist Manifesto in a future lecture, and also again, the Theses on Feuerbach, which is my next lecture. Um, I'm starting with Marcuse so that we can kind of go backwards here a little bit. Um, but what Marcuse is saying is that, of course, initially there was a revolution. The bourgeois rise to power was a revolution over the feudal um, uh, social reality of, of um, uh, the medieval or late medieval um, Europe, right? So, so um, yeah, the idea of individuality and individual freedom was at one point revolutionary, but a new situation has arisen in the late 19th century, in the 20th century, in which we might as a society be able to realize a more equitable way of doing things. Now, Marx's name for that was communism, right? But that might not be the only name, right? And certainly throughout the 19th century, there are lots of experimentations. But if, even if we look at the thought of John Stuart Mill, for example, if you are reading European philosophy, like historically, you will see that all of a sudden the concerns in the 19th century, whether we're dealing with Mill and the utilitarians, or whether we're dealing with Marx, or whether we're dealing with later Nietzsche and the concept of genealogy, which is reacting to Darwin, everything in, mm -hmm. in European philosophy tends to sort of shift in the 19th century towards, towards the conception of society. So that by the end of the 19th century, we get new disciplines in anthropology, in psychology, in sociology, that have erupted within this new transformed 
um, situation in terms of um, uh, European intellectual thought. That is what Marcuse is thinking of here. And he says that we have a new social situation where we could create a rational society, or at least we could potentially create a rational society that has arisen. And with this, we have to go beyond just the idea of the individual subject, who's the revolutionary subject for bourgeois society, and we need to um, push into a realization of a society that can allow us as individuals to flourish. Um, so again, this is what social theory, as he says, social theory arose to accomplish this idea of a rational society. Um, but what if the project of that rational society doesn't work? Critical theory arises in the method by which one addresses this situation. In critical theory, freedom must be attached to the intersubjectivity of the social order as opposed to the pure bourgeois individualism. It also emphasizes analysis, critical theory, right? Emphasizes the analysis of the present without succumbing to critiques that it relies on the utopianisms of social experimentation during the 19th century based um, on rational positivism. Of, however, utopian refusal remains a technique for maintaining an awareness that is at least possible for social for society transform to transform. Okay, so how do we unpack this? Um, uh, thinking about when the Frankfurt School arises in Weimar Germany in 1922-ish, um, one of the things that is going on here and um uh, as a, as the institute for social research is founded is an analysis of of why um uh marxian society or marxian revolution didn't quite work now we've just had the bolshevik revolution in russia in 1917 um the russia has been in a civil war um during this particular period germany has not gone um, after World War I to um, uh, uh, the communist impulse that's going on with the Bolsheviks and to the east of them. Um, they have founded a liberal democratic republic that's partly been imposed by them, by the Allied forces after World War um, I. And um, uh, then we have also right-wing impulses right within Germany um, that want to go back to the Kaiser to Kaiser Wilhelm um, or go back to a monarchical society like the Prussian Empire something like that um, and so Germany in, in the middle of of the, this situation the eruption of this Institute for social research is trying to to analyze this situation now of course because they are relying heavily on Marx and Marxian analysis yes they have that they tend to be situated on the left in their initial context here um, as opposed to right-wing critiques of liberal democracy they are giving a left-wing critique of liberal democracy but they have not necessarily aligned themselves with um uh bolshevism and with communism as um it has been formed under um, vladimir lenin to the east and there's been an ongoing critique as we will see when we read lenin in a few weeks um there's been an ongoing critique from uh lenin at lenin and from rosa luxemburg um against german social democrats um, or the idea of socialism, because they feel like it's not extreme enough, like to create create the revolutionary potential um, to bring about um, a communist society, which relies on, um, as we will see with Marx, the um, uh, the dictatorship of the proletarian. Right? It's like socialism, ac according to the 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 more extreme communist critique, is to um, uh um uh beholden to a kind of bourgeois middle class idea of society it doesn't overthrow the bourgeois society and allow for the revolution to take place so that's the critique going on there now um 20th century communism under lenin and then later under stalin and then later under mao for example of course tries to set up these rational societies 
And um, so when we come back to this question that Marcuse has here, remember he's writing in the mid 1930s, what if that project of a rational society doesn't work? Now, originally, you know, he's he, you know, he, he's telling the story of the, the birth of, of critical theory in the Frankfurt School as well. And they were asking that question, right? What would an actual rational society look like? Why is it not happening? And especially at the end of the 1920s in Germany, um, as um, you know, the Nazis aren't 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 a big thing throughout the 1920s. It's only after the stock market crash in 1929 that we start getting more pushes towards Nazism in Germany. We'll we'll explore this later on in this semester more um particularly. Um, but it starts with just a few seats um that the Nazis get in government and then um, it becomes a, a, a big battle between the, the, the far right and the far left. And the, the German government at the time um, under President Hindenburg embraces um, Hitler and the Nazis as a way to stave off going further left. And that is what really allows Hitler to come into power. Um, so another question that the critical theorists have in the early 30s is like, why didn't Germany shift toward the communist society? Why didn't it fall towards what was already happening to the East in, um, in Russia, right? So that's a question like, and then of course, there's the question of Stalin and, 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 and the horrors that are happening. We'll see this in a few minutes here. So this question that Marcuse is asking right now, like, like, okay, we are in a moment in the 1920s and 1930s with the rise of critical theory where we need to try to understand how a rational society could be conceived and how that would be the next stage after a bourgeois focus on individualism and individual liberty. It's not that individual liberty isn't important to him, right? Or to critical theorists. It's just that that revolutionary moment that produced that under bourgeois society um, is something in the past. And we are in a new situation where we need to realize this not in the, at the level of the individual person, but at the level of society itself. So critical theory, again, arises as the method by one which one addresses this situation. And critical theory, free, human freedom must be attached to the intersubjectivity of the social order as opposed to pure bourgeois individualism. It also emphasizes, critical theory emphasizes the present. We're trying to think about the present, but you know, how do we think about the present if we're not either sort of like saying how we're, we could do better than the past or without how to, to without projecting some sort of future. And utopianism is the, the term for this, like future imagining throughout the 20th, uh, throughout the 19th century, sorry. Friedrich Engels, who's Marx's uh, writing partner and, and, and intellectual colleague, um, uh, uh, talks about utopianism um, as well. But we also could see, if you read American literature, right, in the 19th century, the, the Blythdale Romance by Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, speaking to like, like utopian communes and stuff and experimentations in society that are happening, um, not just in Europe, right, um, and not just under the banner or the name communism. Um, so utopianism is a broader concept. Um, uh, Marcuse is saying that critical theory can't just become, can't just be utopian, can't just be about some sort of um, future that doesn't exist yet, but it needs to at least hold on to the idea that the future could be different than the way things are now, that there's at least a possibility for social transformation. At this point in Marcuse's essay, we get a crucial question. How is critical theory not reducible to economics alone? Now, we know already that it's critiqued the, the way European philosophy has emphasized individual subjectivity, right? The individual rational subject. And it's done so by bringing in an economic and material historical analysis. But how is critical theory not just doing economics, right? Um, it must be 
according to Marcuse, more than a new form of economic regulation. Without freedom and happiness in the social relations of men, even the greatest increase of production and abolition of private property um, in the means of production remain infected with the old injustice. Here, Marcuse is implicitly, in my reading, at least critiquing 20th century efforts at communism. Namely, he is in 1937 critiquing Stalin's um, Russia for having claimed the year before in 1936 that it had achieved um, universal socialism after the starvation and murder of 10 million, apparently by Stalin's own admission to uh, Winston Churchill, um, uh, after the starvation and murder of 10 million people in the Soviet Union and the Ukraine in 1930, between 1930 and 1934, Stalin says we've reached um, universal socialism. Um, although Raphael Lemkin had not yet coined the term genocide, that happens in the 1940s, the famine in Gulag was certainly state-sponsored, and the murder of Kulaks in um, Russia um, in the name of class erasure was a thin ideology, according to my reading. And I think this is what Marcuse is sort of getting at at this point in the essay. If the cost of moving to a rational society is through the starvation and murder of 10 million people, maybe that is like there's a problem with like thinking of that as the rational uh um the the next stage in rational society right so i think that that that's that's the implicit critique that is going on here um now if you're gonna follow stalin's thinking here you know just uh maybe what Stalin is saying is like, well, yes, this is what Marx had already said, that in the transition to a pure communist society, you're going to have this temporary period called the dictatorship of the proletariat, where the proletariat and the working class comes to power. And in that sort of transitional period, there's going to be violence, right? Later thinkers that we'll see, like Franz Fanon, is going to say that every time there has to be a revolution. There, there's going to be violence as part of it. We saw it back with the French Revolution and the terror that arose, or the the beheading of of the King of France and the Queen of France. Right, um, that the 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 bloodletting of the revolution is just going to be a natural part that one has to accept if they are going to be a true revolutionary. Now, again, you know, like. Is that really what's going on? Is that Stalin's excuse? It's like, well, you know, it wasn't really just me. It was just like, yeah, it's just like the growing pains of starting a, a universal socialized country is going to be that 10 million people die, right? Um, I see this as really thin um, um, uh, 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 um, ideology for, for mass murder. Um, whether or not Marx would agree with that is not something that I'm going, uh, I need to go into here, but I, I will just say that I'm distancing my own reading from Stalinism and, and um, Marcuse does as well. So I'm kind of aligning with Marcuse in this, um, in this, although, of, I, although outside of this, I don't think that I align with Stalin. Um, as Marxists often point out, Stalin's totalitarian seizure of power went well beyond the classic Marxian theory, even if scholars also debate how much Vladimir Lenin would have supported Stalin's policies as extensions of his own. That's just a debate that's out there. The expulsion of Trotsky and later assassination of, by Stalin, his later assassination, I think it's in 1940, if I remember right, um, around 1940 in Mexico. Um, uh, the assassination by Stalin is well known and at least constituted a perceived threat to Stalinism. So even though Stalin has claimed universe, that Russia reached universalized socialism in 1936, um, he still apparently needs to track down and kill his potential rival a few years later um, outside of Russia. 
Um, so the United States, um, another thing to remember is the United States and the Soviet Union were allies against Nazi Germany during World War II. So the humanitarian horrors of the Soviet Union were downplayed in the United States, not to mention the fact that Soviet losses during the Great War, World War II, um, reached 27 million, which 19 of those million, um, with 19 of them being um, civilians. Um, the general public in the United States rarely learns much about this part of Soviet history. And Marcuse is writing from the United States at this point in time. He's walking a line in his writing between classic Marxist conceptions of historical transformation, some of which had informed the setup of the Frankfurt School's program for social research in the early 1920s. Um, and then the realities of the 1930s, right? So Marcuse is doing a lot of different kind of work, constellating work in this little essay that he writes here. Again, critical current critical theorists on the left, such as Gabriel Rockhill, who directs the critical theory workshop in Paris and Villanova University, have importantly pointed out that the Frankfurt School theorists and what became critical theory in Western universities was never as left-leaning or liberatory from a Marxian perspective as it had sometimes been situated or has sometimes been situated. And especially for those thinkers on the on the right, especially the current right wing thinkers who th that might see like, oh, Roger Green and his, you know, crit intro to critical theory class or his critical theory center, bunch of leftists like commies, all that kind of, of like the, the automatic that if we're even talking about critical theory, it must be some part of like a like a grand um, extreme leftist propaganda. Um, what current critical theorists are saying is like, no, actually, like the classic critical theorists of the Frankfurt School were not as liberatory as the Marxist, Marxian perspective um, uh, really would have been. In fact, they they become more the pawns, at least in, among critical theorists, the pawns of, of, of uh, liberal democracy um, in the United States, especially because they're being housed in the United States. They've thought at this point in time, in the late 1930s and 1930s, they thought like, well, at least the United States society is allowing us to live. They're not trying to exterminate us. So um, uh, yeah, yeah, I want to resist like the idea, you know, like I might have my own personal politics and stuff, but I'm, I'm teaching this stuff to a broad public because I think that it's useful information for us to think of. Um, but But if you're just casting me as being like, a left-wing extremist because I'm teaching an intro class on critical theory, then you need to wake up. You need to think about like what we actually really know now from a historical point of view. And Gabriel Rockhill, who's somebody who's who clearly just will flat out like say like he's he is a left-wing um uh uh extreme thinker. Um that, that that's where his critique of of critical theory of the Frankfurt School is coming from today, right? And 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 if I'm taking on the task in this course anyway, of of informing the public like who the different kinds of players are if we're thinking about what critical theory is today, um, and also going through the historical situation here. That's that's what my course is about here. Although I really respect Gabriel Rockhill, I think he's a he's a really good thinker. Um, uh, so. Uh, um, current critical theorists have critiqued critical theory for being too status quo, for being too um, uh, a liberal centrist. Um, even today, to mention critical theory, of course, brings out the branding of leftist, which I just talked about. Part of Rockhill's critique is certainly that theory, separated from practice, leads to bu a bourgeois version of critique. If we only think of critical theory as theory and divorce from pra practice or praxis, then we have retreated into a kind of bourgeois idealism, a kind of Hegelianism and at the expense of actual social transformation. So Rockhill's critique is similar as we will see in a future lecture to the critique that Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg made towards German social democrats in the late 19th century. And I don't think, I, I, I don't know, like 
Gabriel Rockhill, if you're out there, like I, 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 I don't feel like I'm, I'm pushing any types of a type of critique there of Rockhill. I, I think that he, he is um, definitely arguing from a, from a more strict um, communist perspective, right. And saying that like, led by, that by aligning him with Lenin, Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg, I don't think that's, that's taking um, Rockhill too far out of con his own context. Um, returning to Marcuse then in this essay, his essay at this point must resist on the one hand too easily following, following or falling into previous um, predictions of earlier Marxian thought while also refusing to abandon the historical materialism as a method altogether. So again, yes, Marx you know, put together this paradigm, but he never really said in his writings, like what the new society is going to look like, right? He like very rarely actually talks about that. And so that realization is left up to um, the communists uh, uh, who think that they're working in his parrot in, in the Marxian framework in the 20th century. Now, the critical theorists have arisen at this point and said like, well, obviously Marx didn't quite get everything right. And so like, we can't just rely on Marxian predictions of the future. We also can't give up the future of thinking of, of, of social transformation as critique. Um, so he says, as he goes on, he notes, critical theory has, of course, distinguished between various phases of realization and pointed out the unfreedoms and inequalities with which the new era inevitably will be burdened. In that sense, yes, it's drawn on classic Marxian analysis um, for the stages of development of different um, uh, uh, class conflicts and class, class revolutions in society. He then notes that, quote, this transformed social existence in the 1930s when he's writing must be determined by its ultimate goal, critical theory's ultimate goal, right? Even as it's at, at its inception, and the critical theory's goal or its concept of an ultimate goal um, at its inception did not intend to replace the theological hereafter with a social one, with an ideal that appears in the new order just as another hereafter in virtue of its exclusive opposition to the beginning and its telescoping distance, right? He's saying that when critical theory starts in the 1920s, um, it's not trying to be purely utopian. It's not trying to present a heaven on earth as a replacement to the, an, ideolo an idealized or ideological heaven in, say, Christian religion or something like that. Um, instead, um, it's trying to be analytical with of the moment that we're in right now, the, the critique of the present. He then shifts towards a qualified distance from liberalism. So he's just said that critical theory is not the same thing as 20th century communism, or even exactly the same thing as just relying on a Marxian trajectory of how the, how society is going to go. Because Marx clearly at this point was not he. Had, he didn't have the full picture, right? Doesn't mean that we should reject Marx. Doesn't mean that we should like bow down to Marx. It just means that like Marx was like a great thinker who pointed us in a particular, in a, in, in a good direction, but, but we're left to a new unfolding environment in history to, to, to see what is right and what is not right. So he's kind of critiqued the left here and at that point in his essay, and then he shifts really quickly and he is distancing himself from liberalism, right? So he then quickly shifts towards qualified distancing from liberalism. Quote, if critical theory amidst today's desperation indicates that the reality it intends must com comprise the freedom and happiness of individuals, it is only following the direction given by its economic concepts. They are constructive concepts which comprehend not only the given reality, but simultaneously its abolition and the new reality that is to follow. So, again, coming back to that question, how is critical theory not just economics? 
you know, liberalism and what is emerging at this moment in the 1930s in the United States is neoliberalism. We'll talk about that later in the course, especially with Wendy Brown and her recent analyses there. When we look back at the formulators of what becomes neoliberalism, they're taking an economic approach that is supposed to be a middle way between Nazism, um, the far right Nazism, and then the leftism of communism. And so presenting like liberal democracy as a kind of center, but also the economic policies of neoliberalism as being their economic realization of this. And Marcuse is saying, mm, well, he's not necessarily responding directly, I don't think at this point, to um, Friedrich Hayek or people who might be associated with neoliberalism, but he um, is definitely saying, yeah, like I'm in America, I am in the United States, I'm in a liberal democracy. It's not, what we're after is not quite that, but it's also not quite Stalinist, Rus like communism, and it's not necessarily just an economic analysis, but we need the economic analysis to, to, to see how we're going to critically be, um, do critical theory in relationship to society in the present so that human freedom, yes, is, is something that um, uh, can become more realized by, yes, a rational approach to looking at society, um, but that's not just going to be um, in liberalism and it's not necessarily going to be in communism and it might be some version of socialism. We don't quite know yet. Um, uh, but um, we need to be attentive, um, highly, highly attentive as critical theorists um, to looking at the new realities, looking how the economic conditions of today or the 1930s for him might be different than Marx when he wrote the Communist Manifesto after uprisings on the continent in 1848. Things change, right? That That's important, like <laughs> history changes. Um, so at this point um, in the, the essay, we might see that Marcuse demands a flexibility in critical theory. If we're thinking about what critical theory is, there needs to be some kind of flexibility. Um, theory is not something static and transcendent. It's not something completely separate from practice. Although I know that certain critiques, current critiques have said this, that it's become too theoretical, it's become too bourgeois, it's become too Hegelian or too idealist. Um, but what Marcuse is saying is that there that's not exactly what theory is, at least here. Um, it's not separate from practice and not necessarily something to be marginalized to poorly funded university programs. Although that's what happened in the late 20th century in the United States. And that's, I think that, yeah, the current, critics of critical theory, the Gabriel Rockhills or the Samuel Moynes are like, yeah, I think that there's some that something that happens later on. Um, and, and we'll be able to critique that throughout the course. But if we're looking back right now and just kind of getting a hold on what critical theory is, and we need to understand um, what the what the earlier theorists are saying. Um, and I, so, and what I'm saying is that Marcuse would agree, <laughs> probably, that 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 critical theory is not just like the province of some kind of like, you know, interdisciplinary program in the humanities or like um, a fringe part of a philosophy department in some university. Um, so nothing is given, he says, and social gains can easily disappear. That's another thing he says. Um, we, well, excuse me, I skipped a sentence. At the same time, um, we need some critical theory needs some sort of future orientation um, because nothing is given and social gains disappear. So we can't just like give a historical analysis and say like, oh, well, this progress happened here and this progress happened here and then take that progress for granted um, with our current situation and like maybe the current situation with race in the United States, for example, this is part of the, part of the problem, right? We can't, there might've been some civil rights gains in the 1960s and 70s, but those obviously did not stay. And when we get this kind of explosion um, uh, of this backlash um, after President Obama is elected as the um, um, first, um, at least African-American president, in the United States, we get this backlash from racists and almost immediately, right? 
And then there's this new discourse, um, sometimes called the new racism, which is really just the old racism. That's just another a, a current, you know, U.S. example, right? And with um, of the ways that we can't just rely on whatever social gains that might have occurred in the past because they can disappear. Roe versus Wade can disappear overnight with the Dobbs decision, right? So, and then and then make um, abortion a completely different issue. So. Um, or, or return abortion to to being to being a, um, not necessarily a protected um, right for women in the United States. So um, we nothing is given. Social gains can easily disappear. Uh, Marcuse associates Immanuel Kant's discussion of the human as as an outdated and bourgeois concept that was never based in reality, but in the ideas of human potentiality. Quote, when the critical theory examines the philosophical doctrines in which it was still possible to speak of man, it deals first with the camouflage and misinterpretation that characterized the discussion of man in the bourgeois period. Quote, Immanuel Kant is famously associated with the beginning of human rights and human rights context, human rights discourse. A lot of times gets traced back to Immanuel Kant. Yes, we could go back to natural law theory um, within Christian traditions as well, but Immanuel Kant seems to be the Enlightenment thinker that's associated with this. And Marcuse says that that idea of man is something that is part of the product of bourgeois rational culture um, and philosophy that is something that's in the past, right? Philosophy is useful or remains useful to critical theory, again, according to Marcuse, to the extent that there's truth value in philosophical concepts. However, even philosophical concepts are to be connected with social facts. Quote, the truth content which surmounts their social conditioning presupposes not an eternal consciousness that transcendentally con constitutes the individual consciousness of historical subjects, but only those particular historical subjects whose consciousness expresses itself in critical theory. It is only with and for this consciousness that, quote, surpassing content becomes visible in its real truth. Put another way, quote, critical theory means to show only the specific conditions at the root of philosophy's inability to pose the problem in a more comprehensive way and to indicate that any other solution lay beyond philosophy's boundaries. Because philosophy just sets itself up to be an analysis of concepts, it doesn't take that extra step that Marx wanted it to take, which is towards transformation of society. Philosophy can describe things. Sometimes its descriptions are right, and those descriptions can be taken as truth, but it takes the critical theorist to be doing um, uh, his, her, or their work um, in order to contextualize that um, for the particular moment. It's a distinction. We don't reject philosophy, but um, it, it, it 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 is it it can't be, stand on its own in or, in order to do critical theory is something different. One of the more famous ideas presented by the Frankfurt School critical theory is in the notion of false consciousness. I mentioned it earlier in this reading. Um, Although Marcuse does not use the term in this particular essay, he essentially he is essentially describing bourgeois society's um, production of false consciousness at that point. Um, uh, so in a previous history, there has been no pre-established pre harmony between correct thought and social being. In the bourgeois period, economic conditions determine philosophical thought insofar as it the, uh, it is the emancipated, self-reliant individual who thinks. In reality, he counts not in the concretion of his potentialities and needs, but only in the process of the realization of capital. The, su the subject thinks within a horizon of untruth that bars the door to real emancipation. So again, this is like dense language, of course. Um, what bourgeois society produces is the idea of the self-reliant individual. Self-reliant individual works by appropriating property to his own being that he can control because once it's his, he controls it. He also does this conceptually 
with rationality by relegating everything to a realm of concepts within the individual mind. This is what continental philosophy had done. But by doing that, it alienates the individual from the actual social and material conditions um, that are real. So bourgeois society creates a kind of fantasy structure or a false consciousness in which the idea of individuality and individual freedom um, of this rational subject um, uh, is operating within um, a, a horizon of untruth. So all facile or easy claims to capitalism's meritocratic emphasis on the individual self-reliance, you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of idea, um, are operating, at least according to Marcuse's analysis here, within an ideological realm of untruth. Um, you might see some sort of gains within your own particular system there, but what you're doing um, in terms of ultimate reality is operating through untruth. So this is not to say, of course, that individuals do not matter. And this is where I think right-wingers like really miss the boat <laughs> in terms of what critical theory is doing, right? Um uh, it's, they're not saying that individuals don't matter. Rather, the manifestation of the modern philosophical subject governed by the capacity to reason is only overcoming its own conceptions subordinated to rationality's ordering principle. You need to read more intensely um, 19th century philosophy um, with its social turn, with the idea that we need to think about society as a whole. That's fundamental to critical theory. If you're not taking that into consideration and only talking about the power of the individual subject, you're not doing critical theory. Um, our needs and the potential and potentialities are real and must be realized in the physical world. Critical theory recognizes the initial emergence of the rights-bearing individual as emancipatory. Yes, bourgeois culture was a revolution. It was a progressive revolution against feudalism, right? Um, but bourgeois society's fiction of rationality and self-reliance created a status quo notion of this entity that operationally removed the individual from its place within a larger social matrix. The result is that the, quote, freedom of abstract reason has become empty of any capacity to liberate. It's no longer, the ideal of freedom is no longer a revolutionary idea because the individual subject within a bourgeois system um, is no longer revolutionary. It's a status quo concept. Critical theory's historical task then will be to maintain a focus on the emancipatory potential of bourgeois rationality as it emerged when it was revolutionary, to hold to, hold to the truth when it actually was a revolutionary truth, um, and not let it fall into this kind of status quo ideology of the meritocratic uh, um, uh, uh, rational subject who's completely self-reliant, um uh and and doesn't you know i don't know doesn't want to pay their taxes or something like this i don't know how we take that into um current um political like uh uh um debates that 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 you know are rampant in our society um you know the taxes is just maybe one maybe it's an oversimplification uh, another foreshadowing, but the Marcuse's thought here, and if you've read a lot of Marcuse, you, you might be thinking with me, like, it's like, wow, Marcuse is writing this essay in the late thirties and like it's before his big famous books. And like, yet we see Marcusean thinking really at work here. Right. So this is another foreshadowing of Marcuse's future thought, which can be seen in his turn towards imagination and fantasy at this point in his essay. If enlightenment rationality, according to his thinking here, has locked the individual into a conceptual prison determined by rational ordering, then we must look towards the irrational, towards feeling and towards imagination. It doesn't mean that we don't look towards the material physical history. Marx gave us that and an economic analysis gives us this, but that alone isn't enough. Again, that question, how can critical theory not just be economics? Well, we also have to turn towards feeling and the imagination towards the irrational. This is that point 
in critical theory in the mid 20th century that becomes quote cultural marxism and where the current some of the current critics of critical theory of the frankfurt school want to say they retreated into a kind of idealism they retreated into a kind of hegelianism that's not what Marcuse thinks he's doing right here. You know, so the charge might be correct. I'm not going to come down one way or another on that. That charge is out there. Um, I think it's poignant. But I will say that I don't think that Marcuse at this point in his turn, in his turn towards cultural analysis, um, that he is doing that because he's just succumbing to some sort of um, a liberal bourgeois um, democratic society, um, uh, um, although one might say, yeah, well, it's just he's like he's living in the United States and that's seeping in. His comfort is seeking, seeping, seeping in. Um, he instead wants to turn towards the origin, irrational and towards the, uh, the idea of imagination. Now, that idea is going to become really more articulate in his first big book, Eros and Civilization in the late 50s, and what will be called he later in his philosophy, the aesthetic dimension. More broadly for critical theory, and all, not just Marcuse here at this point, is the intentional turn towards aesthetic products, culture, and the con unconscious as sites for analysis that accounts for what traditional Marxian thought was missing. Again, it's not to turn back to Hegel, it's because there's something missing and Marx as it's originally presented. And certainly there's something missing in Stalinist claims to a universal socialized society. Fantasy here is not merely an absurdist turn towards representational exhaustion, though that was certainly a part of mid 20th century literary efforts. And we can think about Samuel Beckett and absurdism and literature, right? And of course, Beckett is informed by leftism, totally, right? Of course, Bertolt Brecht is doing this leftist kind of drama that influences Samuel Beckett as well, right, for taking the literary turn. Um, but um, uh, um, I think that Marcuse is after something more than just um, absurdism, than claiming absurdism, or claiming ubu wa right, um, uh, per ubu, um, uh, um, if, we're, if we're thinking about strains of, of, of French thought um, that becomes later on situationism, um, which is another 20th century critique um, uh, but, um, that draws on aesthetic analysis for sure. Um, so fantasy is not merely an absurdist turn towards representational exhaustion, though that was certainly a part of mid 20th century literary efforts. Quote, in replying to the question what may I hope? Fantasy would point to less to an eternal bliss and inner freedom than to the already possible unfolding and fulfillment of needs and wants. So again, here, what we see Marcuse is dealing with is that question. He's like, 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 yeah, critical theory needs to have a sense of the future. It can't be just a utopian version of the future. It can't just be a looking at the past development of historical materialism in this kind of linear fashion because progress is not necessarily linear. There will be gains that are lost. And um, what we need to have is an, a, a constant attention to the present or a presence of mind, which is what Walter Benjamin will say in a future essay that we'll read in this course. We need to have presence of mind um, and that presence of mind can't be relegated to economics alone, and it can't be relegated to idealism alone. And what needs to open up here is this idea of the imagination, the imagination as counter to the enlightenment rationality, rational subject. So later on, after brain theory and stuff, we now know that the imagination is part of our rational being. And that's something to think about in terms of later um, um, uh, uh, um, cognitive science and stuff. So like later 20th century stuff, just throwing that out there that like we don't talk about this this way. But in Marcuse's time, what Marcuse is critiquing is enlightenment based rationality. And he's saying that the way to do that is through imagination and through a turn towards aesthetics that. However, we might critique it today, what he's doing at that point in in 
his writing is he is trying to address something that has been missing in Marxian derived thought um, uh, and social experiments in government, for example, um, as well during his period. So the shift towards imagination and fantasy is also a collective response in, among critical theorists toward rationality's instrumental reason, especially as it evolved from scientific positivism. Now, this is a little bit later than Marcuse's essay here, although the, um, uh, although World War II is, is definitely coming here, but just to contextualize this for current day students. Um, for current students, you might consider the recent blockbuster movie Oppenheimer. Um, for whatever his, its historical flaws, like it's not a great film <laughs> um, in terms of, of a lot of things, but for what, whatever its historical flaws about persons involved, um, the film does show how an abstract theory unattached to social outcomes went from being theoretical physics to atomic the atomic bomb in a relative short amount of time under the right political conditions. Now, I know the figure of Oppenheimer in the film is sort of portrayed as like, oh, if I build this bomb, it'll prevent it'll be the bomb of all bombs and like it'll it'll stop wars, future wars, because nobody will want to do it anymore because um, uh, uh, the bomb is just too big. Um, but instead, of course, the Cold War develops, and that's part of the message of the film, like whatever his ideas, uh, his idealism. So the film highlights the shifting political landscape with respect to Oppenheimer's idealism. As a entry for point for considering instrumental rationality, we might also consider this or equally equally important Stalin's murders for so-called universal socialism or the Nazis' final solution for Jews um, and others deemed unworthy of rational modern society. So, quote, scientific objectivity as, as such is never a sufficient guarantee of truth, especially in a situation where truth begins the world truth speaks as strongly against the facts as is well hidden behind them as today. He's writing that in the late 1930s. But when we look back and we see the Frankfurt School's critique of instrumental reason, what we see is that we can't, what they're saying is we can't rely on science alone. Because if we rely on science and humanism in its enlightenment derived sense, then what we end up with is the ability to just exterminate mass segments of society, of human society, which is what's happening in the 20th century. The horrors of the 20th century are coming from our scientific, our explosion in science. And so supposed progress in science has basically brought about the, um, our own death of a species and per the potential death of the entire world. That's what happens when we leave things only to instrumental reason. So science is a product of actual human relations. Science doesn't stand out on its own. It's like, oh, for science, the sake of science, only STEM uh, education, the science of technology and math um, is what we should pour our money into. We shouldn't pour our money into the human sciences. And so, yes, a current critique from the critical theorists would be like, yeah, because Americans, like have, over the past forty years, have dumped all of their money into STEM education, which they, which they still, politicians still, that's their main focus on. They don't focus on any kind of ethical or humanities um, sort of counterbalance to that. They don't invest in that. And what happens with that? We get a complete breakdown in um, civic order, and the and in and we get a breakdown in the political order because people don't know how to debate and talk with each other anymore. Right? We just like do this instrumental rationality where we think science is going to solve everything. And then we get all of a sudden these like ridiculous people who don't believe in any science at all. And on the one hand, and then we get the other people who are trying to say that science and technology are the only things that will save us as if AI um, could give us, um, you know, a warm comfort um, right now. So again, the current stuff. So um what happens is a kind of false consciousness. Socialism's man is just as fallacious as Kant's bourgeois man. Um, it's not going to work for critical theory of the 20th century. This is what where post-colonial scholars that we read later on are going to critique this very idea of man or humanism in its particular Euro-Christian or European-centric 
um, uh, um, uh, historical existence and emergence. So by way of conclusion to his essay, Marcuse notes that critical theory must be crit critical of itself. And that I think we should take today if we're doing trying to do critical theory today as well. We need to be critical of ourselves, of the of it itself. Gabriel Rockhill, Samuel Moyne, the people who are doing critical theory today are critiquing earlier critical theory theorists. Nothing wrong with that because Marcuse has already said this. We need to be critical of ourselves. Um, Marcuse stresses again the danger of reducing critical theory to economism. Now, current Critics are going to say that what happened with this aestheticized turn or the turn towards analysis of culture was that we didn't, that the critical theorists lost hold of their economic analysis. That might be something that's, you know, a, a worthwhile um, charge against them. That's, again, not what Marcuse thinks he's doing at this point. Instead, he stresses that much has changed since the emergence of historical materialism in the 19th century. Authoritarian barbarity of the 20th century signals Marcuse's present. Again, think of Stalin there, which is an annihilation of the individual even while being promoted as a democratic rights-bearing citizen. And he's saying, I think he is thinking like on the one hand of the East of, of Russia, and then on the other hand, he's implicitly critiquing um, uh, the individualism um, present in the U.S. culture. Although I do think he probably needs to be a little bit careful um, uh, as he is a foreigner in a host country. Um, and maybe it takes until the 1950s with the Red Scare and stuff like that um, uh, to see uh, um, uh, why someone like Marcuse needs to be especially careful. Um, he hasn't worked for the Office of Strategic Services yet. He does do turn towards that in the 1940s and works on anti-Nazi propaganda for the U.S. government. And Office of Strategic Services is what then becomes um, the CIA after the war as well, right? So he's working in intelligence um, for the U.S. government in the 1940s. Um Critical theory's task, according to Marcuse, will be to resist succumbing to the falsities of both universalized socialist man and capitalized liberal and meritocratic man. Unsurprisingly, perhaps Marcuse will later write an important book entitled One Dimensional Man as a Critique of Consumer Society in the West. Critical theory must, in the meantime, walk a balance between economics and politics while employing philosophy to highlight the past truths available to liberated subjects without succumbing to a status quo repetition of meritocratic bourgeois individualism. This ends my analysis and my close reading of Herbert Marcuse's philosophy and critical theory. If you like this and like lectures like this, if you gain something from this, please support us on Patreon. If you are paying for this course through a university, please do not support us on Patreon. You've already paid. Um, as much as I, I, I am in need of financial support for sure, um, please do not, if you've already paid for this class as a student, um, feel like I'm asking you to pay more. Uh, but if you are just in the general public and you have the means to support us, um, please do so. This is a labor of love for me um, right now. Um, we will catch up with you in the next um, video lecture where we're going to start d diving back into the 19th century and dealing with Marx. First, his th um, theses on Feuerbach, who's another important philosopher, and then on um, through the Communist Manifesto itself. All right. Thanks very, very much for watching, and we will catch up with you another time. I'm stopping the screen share, and I'm ending my recording. Bye.